The 1994 San Marino Grand Prix was extraordinary, but for every single wrong reason there is to name. It was the third round of the 1994 season at Imola, Italy, of course, in 1994. One of the most famous race weekends ever, and one of the darkest as well. But what actually happened to make this race so memorable, but for the wrong reasons? Well, I'm going to try to paint the picture like Bob Ross, so buckle in, subscribe, like, and enjoy. Well, the weekend started on a sour note to investigate if other teams were using electric aids. Indeed, Benetton were under the most suspicion. Pretty reasonable, as in 1991, they came fourth in the constructors. 1992, they came third. 1993, they also came third. And Big Schumacher had just won the Brazilian and the Pacific Grand Prix. Where has their pace come from? Benetton were under the most suspicion, given their excellent start to the season. I mean, Schumi was flying. On the track, not off the track. No spoilers. No foreshadowing. Although nothing could be proved by their rivals. Things didn't really improve in the first qualifying session. The weekend had just started and it seemed like things were getting from bad to even worse. It's like when you accidentally drop your phone down the stairs. Surely it's only going to fall one, two steps, but it just keeps on tumbling down. Rubens Barrichello suffered a major accident at Variante in his Jordan. The Brazilian was left unconscious having hit the wall airborne at 140 miles an hour. 225 kilometers an hour for all of you others. Swallowing his tongue, although swift work from the medical teams ensured that Barrichello would walk into the paddock the following day with only some minor injuries. Sigh of relief for that one, eh? Imagine if Barrichello didn't make it out. All of those memories at Ferrari and Braun, of course, all non-existent. Saturday, however, would prove disastrous, with Ratzenberg flying off the circuit at the Villeneuve Kink after a front wing failure on his Simtek Ford. The Austrian hit the wall just shy of 190 miles an hour, 306 for, yet again, all of you others. Now that's fast, like, very fast. And as Jeremy Clarkson once said, Speed has never killed anyone. Suddenly becoming stationary, that's what gets you. <laughs> the medical crews effectively found him dead at the scene. Senna, being the good man that he was, rushed to the medical center like he did the previous day for Rubens Barrichello. But once he got there, he was informed by Professor Sid Watkins that Ratzenberger had passed. According to Watkins, Senna broke down and cried on his shoulder. They shared a very close relationship. They were like brothers. In loving memory for Ratzenberger, he decided to put the Austrian flag in his car for the race the next day, hoping that if he won the race, he'd wave the flag and remember his dear friend. Unfortunately, Ratzenberger hence became the first driver to die at a race weekend since Riccardo Paletti was killed at the start of the 1982 Canadian Grand Prix. Now let's hope this is the last death of Formula One ever. We can hope, but it was a somber mood that the rest of qualifying was competed, with Ayrton Senna visibly shaken by Ratzenberger's death. Claiming pole position, Michael Schumacher shared the second row with the Brazilian, while Gerhard Berger beat Damon Hill to third. Now surely Things can't get any worse. A death in Formula One? That's as bad as it can get, right? Right? Well, the start of the race saw even more accidents and injuries, with JJ Leto making his debut for Benetton, stalling on the grid. Pedro Lamy duly went straight into the back of the Finn's car, with the Lotus shattering apart as it flew over the top of the Benetton, sending debris flying all over the catch fencing. Not the best start to a race weekend. Or the race, even. Similar vibes to Spa 2018. Okay, now surely things can't get any worse. Four spectators were hit, but fortunately, no major injuries. Okay, now surely. It can't get any worse. The safety car appeared to allow the accident to be cleared up, with Senna leading Schumacher, Berger, and Hill. Four laps later, the race resumed, with Senna easing away clear of Schumacher, while Berger fended off an early attack from Hill. The season clearly wouldn't be easy for Senna. Schumacher was on top of the world. His car was very fast and Senna saw a threat. Maybe he was pushing that one bit. Senna was pushing. He was definitely pushing. He DNF'd in the first two rounds and was already, well, a hefty amount of points down to Schumacher. If the championship was going to be back on, of course he had to push. Two laps later, however, the racing world would be brought to a complete standstill with Senna sliding off the circuit at Tamarello and hitting the barriers. Unfortunately, the seemingly innocuous incident, thought to have been caused by a steering failure, 
resulted in a suspension arm punching through the cockpit and smashing into Senna's helmet. And the car he was driving was the Williams FW16. It was flawed to say the least. It was a car that Ayrton wasn't comfortable in at all. Saying the following at pre-season testing in Estoril, I have very negative feelings about driving the car and driving it on the limit. Therefore, I didn't have a single run or a single lap that I felt comfortable or reasonably confident. I'm uncomfortable in the car and it all feels wrong. We changed the seat and the wheel, but even so, I was already asking for more room. Going back to when we raced at Estoril last September, it feels much more difficult. Some of that is down to the lack of electronic change. Also, the car has its own characteristics, which I'm not fully confident in yet. It makes you a lot more tense and that stresses you. The race was instantly red flagged with Sid Watkins and the medical crew arriving to find a shattered Williams and a near death Senna. Quick work from the medics saw the Brazilian extracted from the car and whisked away to the hospital. Although Senna was beyond saving, he died later that day. Now this would be the last driver fatality in F1 until Jules Bianchi lost his life as a result of the accident in the 2014 Japanese Grand Prix. And let's hope that was the last one ever. I honestly couldn't imagine a single driver on the grid losing their life. Uh, let's not think about it. Let's just pray that that doesn't ever happen again, please. The race restarted from the grid after a long delay, with the rest of the field not told of Senna's state. This time Bergen made the best start and leapt ahead of Schumacher to claim the lead. Although the race set to be decided on an aggregate result, he only had to keep the Austrian's Ferrari in sight. And well, he did. Schumacher duly moved into the lead a few laps later, before Berger retired with a wheel issue. Nicola Larini then briefly led the race when the German pitted, although he ultimately slipped back behind the number five Benetton when he made his stop. A second round of stops saw, well, another accident cause injuries. With Mihel Alboreto losing a wheel as he pulled out of the pit box, the wheel then slammed into the Ferrari pit box, wiping out several mechanics. Although, fortunately, there were no injuries, major injuries, but yet again, something went wrong. What, what's up with this weekend? On track, meanwhile, there were little changes, with Schumacher claiming a dominant victory ahead of Larini. The Italian claiming his first podium finish. Mika Hakkinen completed the podium for McLaren, and Damon Hill claimed some of the remaining points. After Senna's death, the FAA launched a major plan to slow the F1 field, introducing new aerodynamic rules for the Spanish and Canadian Grand Prix. And since then, well, Formula One's main focus has been the safety, slowing down the cars, well, pretty much every season, and introducing new groundbreaking rules, or regulations, should I say, to keep the drivers safe and keep injuries at a minimum. Let's just look back at the halo. How many lives has that saved? Hamilton's, Verstappen's, Zhou Guan Yu, just to name a couple. Anyway, thanks for watching. Peace.